Hey everyone, you are listening to the Divergent Conversations podcast. We are two neurodivergent mental health professionals in a neurotypical world. I'm Patrick Cassell. And I'm Dr. Neff. And during these episodes, we do talk about sensitive subjects, mental health, and there are some conversations that can certainly feel a bit overwhelming. So we do just want to use that disclosure and disclaimer before jumping in. And thanks for listening. Well, welcome. Do we have a welcome thing? Welcome to Divergent Conversations. We pre-recorded the welcome thing, so we don't. Oh, that's right. Thanks. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. Uh, well, I am so excited, Dana, to have you here. Um, so I was, I mean, I've read your bio actually probably several times, but I was re-skimming it before today and like TLDR, you're a big deal. Does that feel like that captures your bio? <laughs> well, I guess. I mean, I just think that I'm a a parent and I'm a person who's been in the trenches come out on the other side and still living it every day. I think that sums it up. Um, I don't like to think of well, myself. You're very as a- humble. You're very humble. I was very, I was, I was, well, I think that's actually why I really am drawn to you is you are anchoring in your experience and you're not like when I read your book, it's like, you're not coming out as an expert. You're coming out as like, you're one of us, you're with us. Um, well, uh, yeah, it is kind of awkward to toot our own horn. So I I will share um, on your behalf. You are like a national board educator. You've won multiple awards. You have a really successful site. Um, Lemon, remind Lemon me. Lemon Lime Adventures. Lemon Lime Adventures. Um, and you have a program called The Chaos, which then you have turned into your most recent book that is a fantastic book. I... Um, I've really appreciated it. Okay. Was that, was that a more authentic summary of what you do? Megan had reached out to me months ago. I think when you were originally going to come on, Dana was like, Hey, Dana Abraham's going to come on. And I don't know if you know this, but she's a big deal. Like Peter Levine, big deal. And I was like, Oh shit. That's really cool. I also am so ignorant to like the the research here. So really happy to have you on here. Well, I feel honored. You guys, I'm like blushing. I know if people are listening to this, they can't see that, but. We have a track <laughs> record of like making our guests really uncomfortable at the beginning. You're doing but a great for... job. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that we're leaving our tradition intact. <laughs> um, okay. I actually do want to share how we got connected because I think it's pretty, I, li- I like it. So you just published this book, Home the Chaos with Simon and Schuster. Um, I have a book coming out with them in March. And I got a pre, like a kind of pre-order. That's not the name of the book. I got an early copy of the book, which publishers do for people who have audiences. And I was like, uh, oh, it's a parenting book. And like my body kind of shut down. I've read a lot of parenting books. I always walk away feeling like the demands are just stacking. And typically with advice that doesn't actually work very well for my family. So I didn't open it. And then a couple of weeks later, a second book came. I was like, that's weird. And then a couple of weeks later, a third, a third book came. I think, I think the publisher <laughs> no. maybe messed up a little bit. And I was like, okay, universe, I think you're telling me something. So I, I opened it up and I was like, oh my gosh, I really like, this is someone who's one of us. This isn't like a parenting advice book. And then I started reading that. I was like, this person's ADHD. Do they know their ADHD? Because <laughs> there's so many visuals and you break it up into chunks. And then I read the back. And I was like, oh, good. She knows she's ADHD. I don't have to go tell her. It took a long time for me to realize that though. When when did you learn that about yourself? Um, I would say that working, like helping my son and then working with parents online, I always knew like, oh, I really resonate with with a lot of this ADHD stuff. So I used to say, and if I, you know, um, if ADHD had been as prevalent when I was a kid, I most likely would have been diagnosed. I would say that forever and ever. And finally, I was just like, okay, let's just be honest. I am ADHD. (laughs) It's very clear. (laughs) There's no way around this in any other shape or form. So it's really pretty recent, like maybe... I think I've like fully owned it in like the last three years, maybe. 
Oh, I, yeah. I didn't realize it was that recent for you. Yeah. 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 So I am um, like, and obviously it's always been there. I mean, I didn't read a book, like a real book. My husband's like, I can't believe you tell people this, but I didn't read a book until I was a junior in college, not one book, but yet I still graduated with honors and <laughs> like did all the things I was supposed to do. Um, and I just thought, I used to say like, I love the idea of reading, but I just can't make myself do it. I get that. Um, get that. And it took me a long time to realize, hey, that's your ADHD friend. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot I love of clear that. Sign. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That is. Um, I love that you are an author who did not read a full book until you were like 21. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very much so. <laughs> and makes- I wrote a pretty substantially thick book at this point um which is also pretty surprising <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. well um I had something I wanted to kind of dive into today um one of the things I really liked about your your book and just like first of all I could feel who you are when I read your book which I don't know I just there, that takes us that takes a special kind of author where it's like you are sharing of yourself through your pages. Um, But one of the things I was really drawn to is I think you do paradox and nuance really well and the both ends. And there's something you said that really caught my attention. So you talk a lot about that kid. Well, I guess first, do you want to unpack what you mean when you say that kid? I think, um, Mm -hmm. I think many of us were that kid, but what do you mean when you, when you use the language of that kid? So, the name of the book is Calm the Chaos, a parenting roadmap for even the most challenging kids. And I know that that causes a lot of um, frustration in people because they believe that I'm calling a kid a challenge in a bad way. Um, but one of the things that I think or the way I see it is that in every aspect of our life, a challenge is a good thing. We're recording mm-hmm. this right before the end of the year. And a lot of people are going to challenge themselves to set New Year's resolutions and to um, maybe next year challenge themselves to run a marathon, or they're going to challenge themselves to uh, tr- write a book. They're going to challenge themselves to try something they've never done before. And so to me, I think of that kid before I dive in a little more, I think of that kid as a challenge to people around them to think differently differently to do things differently, to try things that maybe they wouldn't try otherwise. And I think that a lot of times parents and teachers, therapists, they're handed these kids that don't fit any of the check boxes and they don't fit in this nice pretty box and labels. And so they don't know what to do with them. And a lot of times they're then left for nothing. The parents are blamed. The kids are left shamed and feeling like somehow they're broken. And, and I think that the ones, the kids that see are able to like be seen as I'm not broken. Nothing's wrong with you. You don't fit a mold. And that's actually beautiful. You're here to kind of change the way things are done and help people be aware. And the parents that actually take that on and say, you know what, I'm here for the challenge. I'm here to look at things differently. I'm here to change the way I do things because I can't keep doing things the way, you know, the way I have been. Mm Because these kids, it's obvious that if you try to do things the way that, as you just said, like when you read most parenting books, the advice just doesn't work for your family. And at the end of most books, it then says, if this didn't work for you, you're either A, doing it wrong or B, you need to see a professional because something's wrong with your kid. Mm -hmm. And that's that's who I'm talking about when I talk about these kids. They're the kids that other people see as too much or not enough in some shape or form. They're either too loud, they're too quiet, they're too rambunctious, they're too shy, they're um, too talkative. I was just talking to my daughter last night. Um, She's now homeschooled. And I said, yeah, I used to always get she has great potential, but she talks too much. <laughs> that was what I always got. I also got grounded when I was younger for being too emotional. I cried too much at movies and um, and I like was really, really just took on everyone else's emotions. And and so I got grounded from movies because I cried too much. Oh like my, that's just like I've never up. heard that kid really. Wow. Well. <laughs> yeah, like I've that's a new one for me. I've never heard that getting grounded for 
being too emotional. I think my mom was trying to protect me because I would get so sad. I mean, there was a movie, I don't know if you remember it, and it's probably, if I go back and watch it, it probably didn't age well, but the movie, The Mask. Did you ever watch Jim Carrey that? Movie? Really, really, really old. Not Jim Carrey. Go even further back. Um, I'm aging myself now. So I'm in my 40s. And there was this movie about, um, it had Cher in it. Cher was the mom. And then the kid had a facial difference. And this is back in the 80s. So, I mean, just like the way the world saw kids that were different back then. And, and I remember, I mean, it was one of my favorite movies back as like a five-year-old and but I would sob at the movie Mm -hmm. because it was just so heartbreaking to me the way he was treated and what happened and my mom was like I ground you from watching tv on your own because you're going to find that movie and you're going to watch it and you know things like my girl or mask like that's the things that I would get grounded from (laughs) my girl that was my first existential crisis and I was five I sobbed and sobbed for hours afterwards and I remember I I actually had a visualization of like you know roller coasters when you're like getting to the top and you, you see the first cart go over and then the next cart and I was like, that's what death is. And I was talking to my mom. I was like, grandma and grandpa are going to die. And then you, and then me. And yeah, my girl wrecked me. Yeah. So you get it. That's I what, get it. That's what, yeah. But my parents <laughs> didn't ground me. They like walked me through my existential crisis. So I'm, I'm so sorry. That's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> didn't have that experience. I think, yeah. And you know, I, I always say that everyone is doing the best they can with what they've been given. Um, I, I truly, I have to believe that just because there's so many things that have happened in my life. I have to say, I think it gets me through a lot. Um, but I know my mom was doing the best she could. And I also know why she struggled to give me the support I needed then, because she was also one of those kids in a family where everyone was high achieving Mm -hmm. and she was the creative soul uh, that struggled with, you know, with, with school, she struggled with math. She struggled with, um, all the things that she was expected to do. And so she didn't want that for me. And so I know that that's part of why she was so hard on me. I was actually just talking with a colleague and we were talking about how, uh, I don't know if we'll take this project up or someone, but there really needs to be a book on neurodiverse families and I think this, mm-hmm. like this multi generational process you're describing, happens a lot with typically limited awareness into what's happening. Where, like, if I haven't worked through my able, well, I'll, I'll ground it in my experience. When I didn't know my daughter was autistic, when I didn't know I was autistic, I would see an experience like in early childhood meltdowns or sensitivity. And those are things I'd repressed in myself. So, of course, then I'm going to want to repress them in my daughter as an extension of repressing them in myself. And so there's a lot that gets transferred because our shit gets kicked up by our kids stuff, especially if we don't have awareness and we haven't worked through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, I do want to put kind of a warning out there. My book is meant to be a bridge for people who don't have any awareness yet at all, Mm -hmm. and then bring them to a side where they have more awareness by the end of the book. Because it's not, you know, and that has been some of the kind of feedback that I've gotten is that um, if you're fully aware of, you know, neuroaffirming practices and you, you know, live in this world every single day, then hearing someone call a kid challenging can be really hard to hear. Um, But there's a lot of parents that the first time they come to me, they say, my kid is hard. My kid is challenging. I don't know what else to do. I love them to death, but I don't know what to do. And if I just said, oh, love them for who they are, they get a lot of that messaging and they don't know what to do with it. And Mm -hmm. so the book is meant to kind of bridge that gap and get them to a more aware and understanding and in tune place by the end. So I think that's part of what I really actually like about your your book and your work is I think you have to honor the parents' subjective experience to get them on board. Um, if they feel, and, and I think that can happen of like, when you describe your parenting as hard, you are being ableist, right? It's like, well, that, that it is hard and it's okay that it's hard. Like we're creating new patterns here. We're 
um, trying to fit into systems that, that like, there's no template, like this is hard. Um, mm -hmm. we, you know, someone whose work I also really admire, Amanda Diekman, we had her on the podcast a while back. She talks really openly about having parental PTSD and, and from a, like, similar to me, she's parenting, um, PDA children. And there's, mm -hmm. th there can be with there can be like the whole family can be locked in kind of fight flight mode and it can be really stressful for the whole family. So how do we not pit like the parents versus the kid, but how do we support the whole family? Um, I, I think that becomes such an important part of the conversation. Yeah. And until recently, I mean, 10 years ago when I first started kind of on this journey of sharing what I was going through and what I was learning as I was going through it, none of this really was easy to find. And mm -hmm. within the last couple of years, it's become easier to find information and parents have become more educated and more aware, but there's still a slew of parents and especially educators who don't know this information. And so they do need, they need someone there to be that bridge. And a lot of times the the people who like my son, he's not going to be the one that has the capacity to be that bridge yet. And so if I can have the capacity to be that bridge, I'm willing to do that. And so that's kind of where I find myself in this weird space where, you know, when people pick up the book, they're not quite ready. They are struggling with the behavior because they don't know any other way to describe it. And then mm -hmm. as we kind of go through. And I know that's what caused most of the problems with my mom and I, when I was growing up is just how different I was from her. And my behavior came out as what I describe in the book as like that fierce kid who is, you know, very, and, and I don't like this term, but it's the term that everybody knows is strong-willed, right? The one that mm -hmm. is just like, knows what they want, isn't going to back down. My mom and I had like such a volatile relationship for most of our relationship. And I think she wouldn't have picked up a book about neurodiversity because she didn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Whereas she would have picked up a book about raising challenging kids because my brother was bipolar and was in and out of every school that she had ever tried to put him in and any service she had tried with him. And she had done all the suggestions. And then myself, who, even though I like achieved all the things she wanted me to achieve, I still was... a a challenge. <laughs> I definitely pushed her and, um, and what, you know, like my mom wanted me, she put me in ballet and she like made my hair all pretty and curly all the time. And, um, she wanted me to wear pink, pretty dresses and wear makeup. She put me in, we have something here in the South called cotillion, where you learn how to like dance properly with a partner. Um, and she put me in manners classes where I had to learn how to like set a table and do curtsies. I mean, really like all the proper things that a, a young lady should learn how to do. And I had a black bedroom as a 15 year old and wore only black and brown and you know wanted to dye my hair with Kool-Aid and, um, wanted to just get away from anything, you know, systemically female in any way as I was growing up. Um, so we just, we were polar opposites. And, and so she would have come, she needed something that met her where she was and, mm -hmm. and then allowed her to see me for who I am. Hmm. And so that's kind of where I think my work falls. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the beauty though. And writing from that perspective as an author and an educator and a researcher of like really sharing the in-depth day to day, the moments that are actually happening, because those are the things that people are looking for when they want support and affirmation. And just to know like, okay, someone else gets it right. Like someone else has experienced something similarly. And now I don't feel as alone in this. And I, I think that's really beautiful to be able to be vulnerable in that way. And to kind of highlight both sides of the bridge, as you, as you kind of mentioned. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to actually ask the question that I set out to ask uh, 15 minutes ago. This is definitely why it's called Divergent Conversations, and we love it, the organic trails. Um, so, so right in the beginning of the book, you talk about how you had two goals for your son. And again, you, I think you're anchoring this in, in your experience and your brother's experience of what you, kind of the trajectories you saw. But you say, one, I wanted my son to stop blaming 
blaming himself for not fitting in. And two, I didn't want him to blame the world for not understanding him. Um, Mm -hmm. I love this, that these were your two goals. I have thoughts about it, but first, just why did you write that? Why was that important to you? I think for me, from my personal experience growing up, feeling like I never, I just didn't understand why I didn't fit. I didn't know if I was adopted. I didn't know if I was born to the wrong family. I didn't know if I was born in the wrong body. Something didn't feel right as I was growing up. And from a very young age, I took that on myself and I was um, really hard on myself. And I think that's why I did achieve the things that I did. But on the inside, behind closed doors, I thought terrible things about myself. I hurt myself. I thought about not being part of this world anymore from a very young age. And I had friends who that same thing happened, but they weren't, they weren't as lucky and they ended up not staying in this world. Mm -hmm. And a lot was because they didn't feel like they fit. They didn't feel like others understood them. They didn't, they felt like something was wrong with them and they couldn't be who they were. And then, and I know this is really heavy, but I think that's why this goal was so important to me. And Then with the other side, I feel like my brother very strongly fits into that category um, because he never was able, and he had a very real struggle and a very real difference um, that not many people knew much about, especially in the seventies and eighties when he was growing up. And, and so, but he, he, he was given lots of opportunities of help and he wasn't able to access that help and he wasn't able to take the ownership And he blamed my mom. My mom worked so hard to be the absolute best mom she could be for him. And my mom's no longer here. And he still, to this day, I believe, blames her. I don't know because I don't speak to him. But he he took it upon blaming everyone else. And that anger came out as really aggressive, really damaging behaviors where he ended up damaging his relationship with everyone that loved him most. Um, And I just didn't want that for my son. I didn't want him to end up growing up feeling like he wasn't worthy of being in this world. And I didn't want him to grow up and feel like everyone was out to get him and there was no hope. And the only hope was to put that anger out towards others and hurt others. And so that was where that, that goal initially came from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, first of all, thank you for, for sharing that. I, um, it is heavy. And also our lives tend to be heavy. Um, I, I also took the first way with you and, um, had a lot of self-harm, had a lot of thoughts of not wanting to be here. Um, and, and I, and, and similar to you, it was, I was taking on the badness. Um, and that's something, you know, in psychotherapy, um, especially from kind of the psychoanalytic tradition, we talk a lot about of, um, Like, well, like when someone from an early age, when there's some injection of like bad object, and then it can become this, like, I'm the bad object or others are the bad object. There's this, um, almost splitting that can happen where seeing any other way becomes really difficult. And I I think it makes sense. I, that neurodivergent people would be more vulnerable to this split because of our early experiences. I'm curious, like, what is the third way in your mind? So if, if not falling into these, if these are two like ditches on the side of a road, like what, what's the third way? So I think that we are, especially neurodivergent people are very prone to look at all or nothing. Um, there is, there is just these like very linear ways of thinking. There's it's, it's all everybody else's fault or it's all my fault. And the option that I'm kind of presenting is let's remove fault and let's Mm -hmm. impose some understanding and compassion because the other, like for ourselves, first of all, why do I do what I do? What makes me tick? Um, How does my brain work? How, How do I work best? What are systems that help me be successful? And then why are other people struggling with this? Like I knew that I couldn't like put my son in a bubble Mm -hmm. and be like, I understand why you have these very big aggressive meltdowns. And 
yes, you can go to Walmart and have this very big aggressive meltdown when you're 18 and it will be totally fine, right? Um, I, I couldn't put him in that bubble. I needed him to be like, I needed him to know that this is what the world might think when this happens. And so, you know, I need you to be aware of that, that they don't have the understanding. They don't have the, um, the awareness yet to know what's going on to support you. And so um, they might respond this way mm-hmm. and just kind of giving them that awareness. And then as he got older, giving him the skills to be able to advocate and being able to set boundaries and being able to set up certain parameters. Um, so like, this is a really weird, random example. This is a silly example, actually, this is what happens, right? I said earlier, I have word retrieval and if I like struggles. And so if I don't have any sort of notes, I just come up with weird examples, but my daughter is in the nutcracker and has been in the nutcracker since she was um, three. And so she's, it's nutcracker week. So that's probably why it's top of mind. And there was one nutcracker performance where my son had a, he's now 18 and he had a really big meltdown right before we went in and started running in the streets. And, you know, before I knew what best ways to support him, I kind of held him right. And didn't know what the best way. And the police were called by people on the inside because they were worried I was hurting him. And then, um, he, the police came and he ran from the police and he was only like eight at the time. Mm -hmm. And once he settled, we were able to find out he was so afraid of having a meltdown inside with all the noises and with all of the people, he didn't want to have a meltdown in front of people. So he ended up having one outside. So we now, we knew that, yeah. right. And, um, much later and, I, you know, he could potentially from that be mad at himself for quote unquote, ruining his sister's performance or my ability to see his sister or whatever he could blame himself, or he could blame the performance hall for not understanding or me for not understanding or the police for not understanding. Um, and one of the things that has come out of this is it's Nutcracker Week this week. We have no meltdowns. We have no stress over it because he's able to say, I say, it's Nutcracker. I'm going to be working with your sister. There's a performance. I assume you don't want to go, but I'm happy to get you tickets if you would like. And some years he'll go and he'll put on headphones and he'll watch on his phone just so he can be there with his sister And some years he says, no, thank you. I'm feeling overwhelmed this year. And he doesn't go. And so he stays at home and we all go to the Nutcracker and he is not mad at us that we don't include him. And he's not mad at Nutcracker for not understanding, you know, and the rest of the world for not understanding. And it's a small example. Like it's, I I don't know if it's a beautiful example. It makes so much sense. Absolutely. I'm actually like, so it's just one, one moment. Um, and those moments throughout his whole life, right? Like they build up and I just want, I want that kind of thing for my, my son. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I interrupted. Oh no, totally fine. This is, it's a beautiful (laughs) moment too. And I felt myself getting emotional as you were describing that because it feels so validating and it feels so affirming and like everyone seeing each other's needs. And one thing you didn't mention in that, and I, I'm just, I assume, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. You said, he's not mad at us. He's not mad at the venue, but it also sounds like you're not mad at him, right? For not going. And that's the full circle moment right there where it's like, that's the beauty in all of this. And I think that's just a wonderful, wonderful example. And my daughter's not mad at him, right? Mm -hmm. I hear this all the time. I hear from parents, even just friends, they'll say, well, it's so-and-so's performance. And so they have to go. And I'm like, but do they have to go? Why do they have to go? you know, or parents who have a value of um, a certain religion and they go to church and their kid really struggles at church. I'm like, but do they have to go to church? Right. There are other ways you can share that value with your kid without making it really hard for them to navigate this. Because it's just, if they go to church and they have a terrible experience every time they go, it's going to be much harder for you to teach them that value if the only thing they connect with it is I go and I get in trouble for not sitting, for not being quiet, for making too many noises, for running away, for taking the microphone from someone, whatever it is that they have done, 
um, they're not going to be able to hear or learn the lesson that you're actually wanting them to learn, Mm -hmm. which is that, you know, if you believe in, in this, then it's that, you know, there's a higher power that's here to support us and help us. And we can learn good lessons from, you know, we can do that without exposing them to the, to having to sit and having Mm -hmm. to have painful experiences. So I wrote down, cause I liked it so much. Let's remove fault. And then one thing I'm mm-hmm. hearing is like, and I don't know if I'm putting words into your mouth. So I'm curious if you think this works, like let's remove faults, fault and let's shift to talk about needs and per, and values mm-hmm. perhaps. And where um, like needs and values can sometimes conflict in family, but it's like, let's have a conversation. How do we get people's needs met in a way that works? So I love this shift from fault to needs. Um, which is also like, that's bedrock of nonviolent communication. I don't know how you feel about that theory, but that is like, let's talk about what people need here. Cause it's often unmet needs that aren't recognized that escalate situations. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's where I've always kind of leaned towards is understanding the needs under the surface. Um, and how do we, how do we help parents understand that? and simplify it so much that then they can help their kids understand it at a young age, at a very young age. Um, So, you know, I, my daughter is, she's 10 and we now homeschool her because dance is so important to her that she's able to explain that, you know, and share her needs and say, I don't have capacity to do school at school and also do dance. So I can only handle one at a time And dance is really important to me. And so this week during Nutcracker, our homeschool looks like her, you know, she's making Google slides with her Christmas list and she's, you know, writing letters to the elf, which is self-inflicted. I, this is not my plan. Right. Um, And she's, you know, doing things and that's, that's all the capacity she has because outside of that, she's going to be surrounded by so many humans this week and she's going to be on stage and she's going to be putting on very uncomfortable costumes and makeup. And, and so I think if we can have that understanding and that compassion for what are her needs. And, but if I forced her to go to school, we would, she would be unhappy. She would be frustrated and I would be unhappy and I'd be frustrated. And so when we can look at it from a needs perspective, it can really open up a lot of, a lot of that connection and relationship. And also the things that I think a lot of parents want most, which is eventually for their kids to feel independent, successful in whatever way that that looks for your kid. It just doesn't look like what most parenting books make you feel like it should look like. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Um, So one thing Patrick and I talk about a bit on this podcast, and I talk about a lot on my website is like misdiagnosis, the importance of diagnosis. I think this is one of the reasons why like early identification, whether it's a medical diagnosis or identity identification is so important. Most of my guilt I have around parenting is those early years before I understood what was happening with my children. And we were more locked into a fault mode because we didn't have the language to understand what the needs were. And I think this is partly why it's so tragic that so many children, especially girls, do go unidentified because then the parents don't have the accurate lens to like, let's explore needs. Let's explore what's happening here. Let's understand what a sensory meltdown is. Yeah. I think that's why I wanted so badly to, to write and do the work that I do is because I think there's the majority of parents will, unless it's just so almost so obvious where they have an experience, like I might've had with my son, where they're led down the path of diagnosis and trying to um, figure out answers. They might never, ever become aware of these other needs and what could be, you know, this different way of looking at interacting with kids. And so I wanted, that's why I wanted it to be such a bridge is because I want, I want parents who just think their kid is strong-willed, who just think that their kid is being difficult, who just think that their kid is manipulating them. I want them to have a place to come and then be like, oh, wait a second, there is so much more here. And, and if it leads to a diagnosis or an identity, 
then more power to them and to their kids, because then they're going to um, have even more resources and supports and understanding. Um, but if it doesn't, at least they'll still have more resources and support and understanding and compassion than they would have if they just thought, well, my, my kid is neurotypical, which they wouldn't even have that word. Let's be honest. Right. They will say my kids, nothing's wrong with my kid. That's the one I they, hear they all would the have time. Character. Like, oh. <laughs> what what yeah. they have is character labels. My kid is yeah. strong willed. My kid is manipulative. Yep. They have these character labels, um, which are so like the kid feels that right. Like that that is so. I, I'm sure all of us grew up with labels that we have for ourselves and that are that our parents had for us. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Just thinking about this, I'm like, man, I wish my parents won had more awareness when I was growing up to had a resource like this, because I'm thinking about myself is in like when from 10 to 16, I never went to school, but I got straight A's. So I never understood why I got in so much trouble to have to go somewhere where I got so overwhelmed so easily. If I was, you know, just performing, like you said, uh, Dana, in a way that felt okay to me. And it just felt like every time I had to go to school, I got sick. I had no energy. I was even more depressed, even more isolated, self-soothing in my room even more. And to my parents outside, I was like, everything's fine. He's got straight A's. He plays soccer. Everything's good. And I just, it's just so amazing when we, we start to look at this from a needs-based perspective and, and having clear communication and curiosity too. Mm-hmm. So I have a really silly, messed up story. I don't even know if this is going to add to the conversation, but I just associated to it. Um, this is more about just, yeah, school is so sensory overwhelming for, for kids. And I, I begged my mom to be homeschooled. Both my parents were professors, so that wasn't really an option back then. But I, I got pneumonia when I was 13. And I think I stayed home from school for like three weeks. So in high school, I, I hated going to school. This is really messed up. And I'm, I, I don't know if I'm smiling because it's so messed up or if this is a defense, but I like, it was middle of winter. I got on like wet clothes and opened the windows. I was trying to give myself pneumonia so that I could get out of going to school. Oh my goodness. But I I don't think that that's, um, I think it's way more common than you think it is. Mm -hmm. You know, of like, what are the ways I can get out of this? Whether it's conscious or unconscious. I think a lot of our kids even now are doing doing that um whether it's getting in trouble so for my son it was he was getting in tons of trouble so he wouldn't have to go to school Mm -hmm. um that's clever yeah because he would he would get suspended you know yep and then go back to school and he'd get suspended again and it was just suspension after suspension and i'm like you know and my 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 middle now he's the one only one in a traditional school setting because he still wants to be in one um, even though I don't think it's the best placement for him, but we're still working on that one. Um, so he is at a traditional high school. He's 16. And cause he wants that experience of being, you know, at a high school and, um, he's dyslexic and he gets sick every once in a while. And he actually wants to go to school or says he does. And then he, when he gets sick, he's out for like two weeks. Well, it just so happened. It happened at the beginning of the school year. And so he was out for two straight weeks. He missed the whole first two weeks. And um, once he's missed a day, that's all it takes for him to not be, because he has to pay attention every day. And during that two weeks, he was like, mom, I have to work so hard just to get C's. And I was like, I know, hon. And that's why I'm okay with us doing an alternative version of school. Like, you know. Um, this isn't about you. This is about the system and the way that it's set up. It's not set up for you. And, and so, but he still wants to go. So he ends up at the end of the two weeks going back. And obviously he's so far behind in all his classes. So he figures out this elaborate way that he can go. They have three lunch periods because it's a huge school. So he figures out that he can go, his lunch period was um, lunch period one. He could go to lunch period one and then, he could go hide out in this little space after lunch period one and wait for the bells to pass. 
And then he could go to lunch period two with his friends that were at lunch period two. And they could hide out for a second and he'd go to lunch period three. And because my 16 year old has facial hair, he looks like he's 18. So he looks like he's a senior and seniors don't have classes in the afternoon. So then he could just stay in the courtyard for the rest of the afternoon and no one would ask him a single question. So my son successfully skipped class from the time that he got back. And I knew about most of this because he's really honest with me. He'll tell me what's happening. And I was trying my hardest from home to get him to like find alternative ways to get the learning or to get to class. And I said, like, again, if they find you, this is what's going to happen. If they find out you've been skipping, this is what, what could happen. And but he was finding every way to not go to class because it was so uncomfortable for him. And now we finally, it got to a point where they finally figured it out. Um, and I just went to them. I'm like, he's been not going to class for 10 weeks and you just figured it out because I brought it to you. Right. Like this is, this is a bigger, a bigger problem. Here. And so, um, but once he did get into these classes, the teachers were like, I get that you have accommodations, but you still have to show up to class. And since you didn't show up to class, you still have Fs. And I'm just like, we're just putting this kid in a place where he literally cannot climb out. And so he had two teachers who just stuck by that all the way. We're at the end of the semester. Mm -hmm. And I just got an email and he was like, mom, she wouldn't help me. So I just decided I was going to sit in class and do nothing. And he's mm -hmm. super honest about it. But he's like, I did all the other classes. I made up all my work. But this teacher, if she doesn't care, why should I care? And I think that message right there is what so many kids are getting. And my kid's not acting out, but he's just shutting down. Like, that's not a place where we want any of our kids, I don't think. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm just smiling because that's like, that was my entire existence and experience. So it's like. But you're right. I mean, that's not where we want them to be. And it's it, that's such a challenging place mentally because it, if we're such black and white thinkers, then it's like, yeah, if this person's not going to meet me halfway or support my needs, then why am I going to meet them at all? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's that change little by little, right? By having these conversations, by helping more people be understanding. Um, but again, I don't want, it goes back to those same two goals. I think they're the same goals I have for each of my kids. Like I don't want my daughter feeling something's wrong with her that she doesn't have capacity to go to school. I don't want her mad at the teachers or at the way that the school system is set up so that she's like, well, it's their fault. I can't do X, Y, Z. And I don't want my middle son blaming, you know, there's definitely some, some fault there, but the more that we can understand that they, you know, they're operating under, you know, 2,700 kids and they don't have the knowledge or the understanding of how to differentiate instruction yet, you know, unfortunately, mm -hmm. um, but that he knows that he's not either broken. Right. And so he, what systems do work for him and what can he do in the classes where he's going to get the support and, mm -hmm he's proven that 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 does work for him because the other classes he's taken his grades from an F all the way up to like B's. Um, and so I think it shows what is possible when kids have that awareness and understanding for themselves. And then they also are given the permission that other people are going to mess up around them. <laughs> like I think that mm -hmm. they need to know that the others don't have that information yet. And it doesn't have to be their job to give them that information, but I think those of us with capacity can be the ones that are sharing that information um, yeah. and hoping to spread mm -hmm. that compassion. Yeah, it really helps like kind of contextualize their experience in an empathetic mm -hmm. way, in a way that, again, builds bridges. I really am drawn to this metaphor you're using of building bridges, because I think um, that actually came up on a recent podcast we recorded of, uh, it feels like the bridge between like, the mental health world and the neurodiversity movement is getting further apart. And like, so we need so many bridges. Um, and I think just in a society in general, we're, we're very polarized right now. Like there's a Pew research study that came out about five years ago that we're more polarized than we've ever been. That was like five or six years ago. And so we need a lot of 
we need a lot of bridges, um, especially as we're navigating these systems that haven't yet adapted to be neuro inclusive, to be neuro affirming. Yeah. And I think I just had this like picture come up and I don't know if it's going to add to it or not. And I've not ever said this out loud, so I, it might not work, but I run a company and I used to have 13 employees. And when I had 13 employees making a change was like trying to move a freight liner. It took so much time and effort to make one small change because you're moving so many systems and processes and things that are happening. And we've taken our company down to like bare minimum. And it's just me, my husband, and one other person now. And change is possible so much faster. And so if we think about the system, the school system, like society, all these things that are still very, very broken, if we can picture them as that freight liner, that's just maybe there's movement, but it's going to take a really, really long time for us to see it change direction. Maybe it'll give us a little bit more compassion and a little bit understanding and realizing why we need to be, to have more of those bridges, like you're saying, because I think it's so easy to throw stones and be like, well, if the school just changed, well, if society would quit wanting so much out of parents and so much out of neurodivergent people, and it's like, yes, and that's not going to happen overnight. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where, where this can, you know, where this comes up a lot in everyday conversation. Yeah. Absolutely. Like these things are so complex. So I, I'm in Oregon and right now Portland public schools, like um, they're, they're going through a teacher strike. And, and a lot of the things they're bringing up are really like important issues. And it's interesting. My, my spouse worked as a district level employee for a long time. So he understands the systems and the state level, like processes around education really well. And so we've been having conversations. He's like, well, this, like, this is the request this is what would need to happen at the state level, but it can only happen during this window of time, which is not this window. So he, as he's unpacking for me, like why it's so complicated, I was like, whoa, I don't think people realize like how complex it is to change systems. Like there's often systems above the system you're trying to change that need to change. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this freight train is right. Like a very, very slow freight train. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm Are we, we're, yeah. well, I was just looking at you, Patrick, because I was like, I think we're at the time where you do the thing where you transition us because I was looking at that's you your job. I, I'm always absorbing like the silences to determine whether or not like, are we in silence because we're all being introspective and thinking about what comes next? Or are we in silence because we're kind of like, we're done. So <laughs> I, I can go either way. I've really enjoyed this conversation, even kind of predominantly as a wallflower right now, because it just feels really helpful. And I think this is, like you said, Dana, something that just needs to be talked about over and over and over again and, and, and spoken about in, in public forum too. So I really appreciate you just sharing your own experience and your family um, history and everything that's going on behind the scenes too. I, I really do appreciate that a lot. Well, thank you. I appreciate just being able to talk openly. I think that especially, I mean, I'm honored to be here and um, the work that you guys do, it, it inspires me. And I remember when you posted about the book coming, like that you were going to interview and the book came out and the comments. And so there is that like trepidation of how openly can I speak? Am I going to say the wrong thing? And am I going to hurt people's feelings? Or am I going to, and so I just feel like we were able to have such a great conversation and I might've said things wrong. I don't know. Um, but it feels good to have this safe place to just speak and, um, and have a back and forth open conversation. So thank you guys for holding that space. Absolutely. We could do a whole other conversation about public learning. I know that's something mm. yeah. Patrick and I, I think have both done a bit of, and it's, um, gosh, that's anxiety inducing as a person with RSD and so important. Yes. So yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. I think we are at the awkward transition point. So Dana, um, thank you so much for coming on. Please share with the audience where they can find your book and find more of what you've got going on. Yeah. So you can find my book anywhere where books are sold. Um, and after you do that, you can go to calm the chaos book.com and I've got some goodies and some bonuses for you when you do that. 
And I am, you can find me on my podcast at Calm the Chaos Parenting and then any social channel at Calm the Chaos Parenting as well. And you also have like a course for parents, right? I do have a a course. We have um, a membership and then a full-blown course with coaching accountability. The best way to get into any of those things is to go through the book. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. And we'll have all of that linked in the show notes for all of you who to have easy access to all of Dana's information. And for everyone that's listening to the Divergent Conversation podcast, new episodes are out every single Friday on all major platforms and YouTube, like download, subscribe and share and goodbye. Goodbye.